Welcome to Global Stage, a podcast highlighting academic and policy-oriented international research on democracy and human development. Global Stage is a production of the Kellogg Institute for International Studies, part of the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. Hello and welcome to Global Stage. My name is Jacob Turner, guest host, PhD student in political science here at Notre Dame, affiliate of the Kellogg Institute. Joining me today is Dr. Jennifer McCoy, professor of political science at Georgia State University and non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Dr. McCoy was previously director of the Carter Center's Americas program from 1998 to 2015, leading projects on democratic strengthening, mediation, and dialogue, and hemispheric cooperation. Most recently, Dr. McCoy was the author of the volume Polarizing Polities, A Global Threat to Democracy, along with her co-author, Murat Somer. Welcome to Global Stage. Thank you, Jacob. Happy to be here. I wanted to start our conversation by talking a little bit about uh, a man and an organization that we're actually both connected to, which is, of course, President Jimmy Carter and the Carter Center. We didn't overlap, but I, I did intern with the Carter Center's America's program in the fall of 2016 and participated in the Carter Center's observation of the Colombian Peace Agreement referendum. So you were director of that program for quite some time, from 98 to 2015, as previously said. If you could talk a little bit about the Carter Center and the Americas program and some of the biggest projects that you were a part of during that time. Sure. Well, when former President Jimmy and Rosalind Carter started the center, they wanted to create a place for a peaceful resolution of conflicts and mediation. So we did work in that area and also strengthening democracy. And they wanted an action center. So this was not a think tank. This was actually doing work in countries, so applied work. But we applied theoretical concepts. We applied our knowledge from research. So we did election monitoring in countries that had, for some reason, a a lack of confidence or a crisis of confidence in their elections in countries from Jamaica to Venezuela to Bolivia. Beginning Um, with uh, Panama, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it began in Panama and Nicaragua back in 1989 and 1990. Exactly. And we continued it through the time I was director. Also, while I was director, we mediated conflicts between Ecuador and Colombia when they had broken off relations after Colombia made an incursion into Ecuador chasing the FARC. Ecuador was upset and cut off relations. We mediated a political conflict in Venezuela between Hugo Chavez and his political opposition, which is actually where my interest in polarization began. We can come back oh, to that. This is a question on my on my yeah. agenda here, so okay. we'll definitely return. All right. And then we did become involved then also with the Colombian peace process, providing some informal advice on that process to uh, President Santos and the peace negotiators. We also worked on dialogue between countries. So we had a project on the Andean countries. They were polarized then. Actually, they were split between those who supported Hugo Chavez. So you had kind of Ecuador, Bolivia, and Venezuela on one side, and then Peru and Colombia on the other side. And so we worked to create dialogue processes among them and to address some of their common problems, including drug production and and other issues. We worked to try and improve hemispheric relations as well. We created a group called the Friends of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. This group is the tool you used to promote dialogue between these countries. Yes, in part. Yes, exactly. And to try to make the OAS become more efficient. The OAS, or the Organization of American States, as sort of the regional organization below the UN, had become polarized itself between a group that Hugo Chavez was leading and then a group that was closer to the United States. So it was very hard for the OAS to come to agreements on protecting democracy or even what was democracy in the region. And you think that your work at the Carter Center with this dialogue helped to bridge these divides? Yes, I think so. For example, one, the relations between Ecuador and Colombia Mm -hmm. were restored. Diplomatic relations were restored. So we assisted in that and uh, monitored that process and assisted in actually mediation between them. Another important project was I organized two trips for President Carter to Cuba 
He was very interested in trying to improve relations between the United States and Cuba, which he had started as president, but then it got interrupted. So he was the first former or sitting president in the United States to visit Cuba since the revolution in 1959. So he went twice in 2002 and 2011. We we went there. Very historic visits. Yes. And the later trip was his visit part of the negotiations between the the FARC and the Colombian government, or was it separate? That was before those negotiations started, but I later went back to Cuba and met with the negotiators, the FARC and the Colombian government in 2014, 2015, as they were negotiating. Historic visits and really historic process. I want to talk a little bit about the peace process in Colombia. One of the most difficult pieces of the the peace puzzle was was having Colombians to broadly accept a demilitarized FARC as a legitimate political actor within their democratic system. So how do you think that this component of the peace deal impacted popular support for the peace process and its subsequent um, success and implementation? And how does it compare to other components that were considered controversial, such as the transitional justice process implemented by the Accord? I actually carried out a research project on this very question with some colleagues from Georgia State at the same time in 2014, 2015. And we were looking at that question about public support. What would bring confidence in the process and support? And the things that did bring the most controversy were exactly The first thing you mentioned, the participation of the FARC in the political process that was expected to happen after the peace agreement. And Colombians were not all in agreement with that. And there was a great deal of dissension. That was the most difficult. Then the transitional justice agreement, not having jail time, but instead it was restricted movement for the FARC, as long as they participated in a process of transitional justice, which would be telling the truth giving uh, reparations, and promising not to take up arms again. Then they could get reduced sentences, but it was more restricted movement. That was controversial as well. But of course, eventually, the agreement was implemented. And so it's been several years now, and there has been uh, some progress. We did see, of course, that some of the FARC did not come in from the cold, and they retook up arms. That these dissident Wasn't, factions. Yeah, there were defections, but that was that was expected because that happens in every peace process. So it wasn't a complete surprise. And then, of course, there have been some hiccups in the implementation of some, some of the other aspects in terms of of the agreement that had to do with ending fumigation. And there was you know some controversy over that and providing training for and credits for former combatants to restart a life, a civilian life, and then bringing the support to those areas that had been under conflict. So some of that still needs to be finished. I want to now return to a topic that you mentioned in passing earlier, moving on to your more current work on what you call pernicious polarization. So my first question is just, how did you get involved in this current research agenda? I had been kind of a student of Venezuela. Through my academic life, I have studied Venezuela for more than three decades. And then with the Carter Center, we went and monitored the elections in 1998 when Hugo Chavez was elected. So we became, President Carter and I became acquainted with Hugo Chavez personally. So when there was a coup attempt against him early in his mandate in 2002, that coup attempt eventually failed, but he was quite shaken up by it. And he asked President Carter to come and help mediate with his political opposition. So we began a very intensive two-year process doing that. And as we were there doing that, I, I could see the country dividing, polarizing throughout this whole process. And really, for the last 20 years, I've continued to watch it. And I saw this process of the the entire society dividing. And it wasn't just having different visions about what kind of a democracy or an economy they should have. They really developed a hostility, one group to another, Mm. and very much disliked, distrusted, and feared each other. And this level of hostility was very extreme. And the term I eventually came up with was pernicious polarization. It's really this us versus them. 
And then I began seeing that happen in other countries. In fact, I could see similar dynamics within the United States, but other countries around the world as well. The Egyptian Arab Spring, Turkey, Hungary, Thailand, many other countries. So I began to study this process in a comparative sense. And I, in fact, recruited a group of international scholars who are specialists in the various countries. And we did a study together and met several times in workshops and published our, our work about that, about the process. The fascinating thing is that these very different countries, we could identify very similar dynamics of how people divide and how leaders, particularly leaders, can really drive this pernicious polarization. Pernicious also meaning it has negative or pernicious consequences for democracy. So it was really this personal experience you had, sort of these insights of processes that you uh, observed during this period in Venezuela that inspired you to look beyond and, and see these common patterns in, in other countries as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So stepping uh, a little broader into the, into the concept itself. So in your edited volume, you define polarization as a process whereby the normal multiplicity of differences in a society increasingly align along a single dimension. Cross-cutting differences become reinforcing, and people increasingly perceive and describe politics and society in terms of us versus them. How does your conceptualization of polarization move beyond some of the more traditional ways of thinking of political polarization, those who are familiar with political science literature may be more used to? Yeah, particularly within the United States, political scientists were looking at polarization along a single line, a scale, and it was an ideological scale. Or how do people, how much distance is there between people, that is between voters or between political parties or political leaders on their attitudes toward different issues? And particularly, they were using one single scale, a left-right scale or liberal conservative that had to do with kind of the role of the government in the economy, essentially. Mm -hmm. And what we could see is that, first of all, what people thought of when you ask them in survey questions, do you consider yourself liberal or conservative, left or right, it was changing. And a lot of cultural variables began to come in. And this was true in the United States, as well as in other countries around the world. So what kind of cultural variables? Are yeah. About? So it could be specific issues like what is your view on immigration or uh, on abortion or women's rights? But it became what we could see is that the main dividing line might be different things. Could be, are you divided as a people over whether the society should be a religious society or a secular society. That was a major line in Turkey, for example. In Hungary, we could define it as a cosmopolitan or a pro-EU versus a nationalist and really Hungary first kind of view. And there again, we saw Orban as leader really driving that divide by focusing on the threat from immigration, from outsiders coming in, diluting the culture of, you know, the Hungarian Christian, Hungarian speaking culture. But really, I think the main difference that we see is that besides, uh, it could be a divide over different issues, is that political identity extends into the society so that people's relationships within their families, with their friends, in different groups, actually becomes affected by this political divide. So that's what we're saying is different than the old or the, the more conventional view of simply a difference of opinion on a, one issue. Kind of aligns with some of the uh, these canonical survey questions about if your child were to marry someone of the, another race or another political party. Would you be okay with that? Exactly. And that's, a, that's a, a typical question to measure affective polarization. How do we feel about the other group? That's a component of what we're talking about. So it's both issues and affect, but it has to do with identity. And what happens is your political identity, which might be you're associated with one particular party or one coalition, but it can also be your political identity if you are strong supporter of one leader 
and or an opponent. So, nice. so in Venezuela, we saw that you're either pro Chavez, you're Chavista, or you're anti Chavista. And so sometimes it is about a leader's identity, but your political identity then becomes like a social identity. And that's where political psychology comes in with how you view suspiciously others who don't share your political identity. So you seem to be discussing another one of your central concepts in your, your recent work, which is these formative rifts. Could you talk a bit about what you see as a formative rift and and how that generates polarization. Yeah, we say those are the unresolved historic debates at a nation's founding or refounding, say after a civil war or after the fall of communism. But those debates often have to do with what is the national identity and who is a rightful citizen. So when those debates are unresolved from the beginning, so in the United States, race and religion are two of those that have been unresolved, then they can reemerge over time. And as every time they reemerge, they really fuel polarization and they have the biggest chance to become pernicious polarization and really become and get polarization entrenched. But how do you see it negatively affecting democracy? What's the mechanism and sequence of events that leads from, from this type of pernicious polarization to real declines in the quality of democratic governance. Yeah, we can see a chain reaction of causal mechanisms. And what we see is that often, okay, society may have some grievances. They may be anxious about unemployment or immigration flows or or whatever, you know, inflation. There may be grievances, but usually there's a leader, a polarizing leader who catalyzes the very strong views. They can even create polarization by putting an issue on the agenda. I would say in Hungary, immigration wasn't even really on the agenda till Orban put it on. A real entrepreneur. A real political entrepreneur. Yes. Even the same with Trump when he announced his first candidacy in 2016 and made immigration, talking about Mexican rapists and killers coming across the border, made it an issue, brought it to the forefront in the public's mind. By these political entrepreneurs use vilifying language and they identify an enemy. Now, this helps people. If people are anxious about something or have a grievance about something and they don't know who to blame, they don't know what the explanation is of their problem, to hear a political leader say, Here's the explanation. The blame is this other group. It might be elites, economic elites, the establishment. That's a typical populist divide. But they would cast blame on some group and cast them as the enemy of their supporters or a populist, they would say, the real people. And as they do that, then then people begin to feel very suspicious about them and they may stop interacting. And as we stop interacting, we stop having communication with people who think differently. That increases our bias against them, our stereotypes and our misperceptions about them. And we become unwilling to compromise. And we don't want leaders who will compromise because we feel like they're going to compromise our values. And when that kind of moralizing judgment comes in, that these other people are evil, or they're going to compromise my moral values, then that makes it really difficult to solve problems as a society. So we either get just government gridlock, and this happened in the United States, just basically Congress becomes paralyzed, yes. or you get people wanting a solution, and either supporting a political leader who says, I'm going to solve your problems, basically by excluding the enemy and by taking power. So we see this democratic backsliding by the concentration of power in the leader, getting rid of checks and balances and accountability. Or there might be a backlash. And particularly if a leader has brought in new groups, we saw this in Bolivia or in Venezuela, bringing in, in Bolivia, the indigenous to power for the first time under Evo Morales, or in Venezuela, bringing in Chavez promising to share the wealth, redistribute yes. the wealth to the urban and rural poor who'd been marginalized and ignored. That might create a backlash especially if you combine it with this vilification of the old elite. And they may try to take back power. 
in Thailand, they actually did take back power. The military came in and stayed for five years as a military dictatorship. So it sounds like one issue that makes this problem particularly difficult is it sounds like it's a bit of a self-reinforcing process. Exactly. So once the entrepreneurial leader capitalizes on grievance and creates this dynamic where people are mistrusting certain groups, likely to create reaction and strengthen that divide even further. So given that, what do you see as the solution to this issue. It seems like an extremely difficult problem. Exactly. It becomes entrenched. The parties get locked into it. It's really hard to break out of. And so, in fact, we are working now on solutions. That's the next phase of this project. We've been looking at depolarizing episodes around the world and over history. We actually found that some of the most sustainable depolarizing episodes, and we're using the varieties of democracy Institute's database that we've been talking about these last couple of days here. But these depolarizing episodes historically over the last century have especially come in the wake of major kind of systemic interruptions. Hmm. War, civil war or international war ending, independent struggles that then get resolved in independence, or democratic transitions from authoritarian rule. Okay, so those could depolarize in the past. Today, we don't have those options, or we don't want those options. We don't want to have to get to violence in order to resolve it. The cost is too high. Exactly. And so we're talking about democratic backsliding, gradual erosion as a problem, or this gridlock. And so how can we overcome it short of going to those major interruptions? And it happens at different levels. So first thing is, Many groups in society and leaders, different actors, need to stand up to a polarizing leader who is also beginning to erode democracy and concentrate power. They need to call this out. So when a leader is using vilifying language, the opponents to that leader, if they reciprocate in kind and use the same kind of vilifying language, they're just going to go down the rabbit hole. It's just going to be a cycle, a downward cycle of polarization. So if they can use different language and begin to focus on the problems, the ideas, the values, not calling out other people as enemies, but instead focus on values, we think that that's one possibility. But it can't just be the political leaders or or the political parties. It has to be other actors in the society. Because a lot of time, the parties themselves, it's very hard for them to break out of the trap. So we need business leaders, academic leaders, media, cultural, entertainment figures to step up. And of course, grassroots. Now, so that's kind of at the level of the leadership or elite level. Within what we call the mass level, there are a lot of efforts to try to bridge the divide. Dialogue efforts, trying to bring people together to again start talking and to listen with curiosity to ask questions and really try to understand the motivations and what's underlying someone else's fear or distrust. And try and I think that way we can find solutions together once we start saying, what do you really value? You know, well, hmm. I value well, I want my children to have to be safe or to have a better life than I did. Many people share those values. We divide on how to get there. But if we go down to the values and we can say, okay, here we agree. Now let's look at what are all the possible solutions, see if we can come up with one. And so it's just beginning to talk again. So there are very, there are structured efforts to do that among citizens, the grassroots level. But there are other things, opposition political parties, when they divide and are fragmented and a polarizing leader has started to concentrate power, they're usually not going to win in elections. And that polarizing leader knows that using anger and hate is a winning electoral strategy, actually. And so we have to see, okay, can positive emotions and hope and enthusiasm also be a positive message and unification? And opposition parties need to unify as well. And that's not easy. That's not easy. We've just seen this week, Turkey is going through this. Today was a dramatic day. They had formed a six-party alliance. They hadn't yet been able to name a presidential candidate. And Erdogan just 
called elections for May 14th. Today is March 6th. That's two months away. Very There's no time. opposition candidates yes. until today. But well. to, that last night, one of the six parties withdrew from the coalition because they didn't agree with the proposed candidate. And so it looked like the whole thing was going to fall apart. But with last minute negotiations, they came up with a great solution. They have a presidential candidate. And then they have two vice presidential candidates. They don't have an elected vice president. It's not like the United States. But they're proposing this group of mm. leaders who will be in charge because the president can appoint uh, vice presidents. So they're proposing sort of this collective leadership. A collective as their, executive. Yeah. Almost. As their proposal. So they've just come up with that today. Really inspiring to hear that leaders – around the world are starting to move against this, this type of problem in, in, in society. You've already started to respond to this, to this final question, but you've discussed several countries that are un undergoing crises of polarization, such as the United States, Venezuela, Turkey, Hungary. And I just wanted to ask if there were any, any additional bright spots that you saw of leaders really starting to try to heal these divides. Yeah, definitely. South Korea is one. They were dividing in about 2015, 16. They had a, a president who was dividing the country, but sort of got engaged in this scandal, both corruption, but also she was following astrological signs and, and people were beginning to be worried about her leadership. And social protests against the government were sort of pressing the political parties to take action. And eventually, the political parties in the legislature came together in an impeachment process to impeach her. And so that was a good use of existing accountability mechanisms. Now, democracy had not eroded and polarization was not so high that the impeachment process wouldn't be trusted. The United States tried that recently against Donald Trump. And half, you know, the Republican Party rejected the process and said it was a political process, not an accountability measure. And half the population rejected it. So that's the problem with polarization when it gets too deep or the political institutions are already stacked with loyalists, as has happened in, you know, some other countries. Then those accountability mechanisms can't work. But in South Korea, it could still work because it wasn't as far along the road. The solution to the problem is going to have to depend on the, the specifics of every, exactly. every case. And there, there is no single silver bullet, and it takes a diagnosis of each country, and it depends on what is the driver, you know, what are the issues that are really driving the polarization there, what are the capacities of the different groups in society, civil society, you know, political parties, how strong are they? And how far along is the polarization and the democratic erosion? All of that matters. There are other variables that are very important. Control of information is an extremely mm. important factor. And in countries like Turkey or Hungary, where the government controls 90% of the information, or in Venezuela, where it's controlling practically 100%. Everything. And of course, you know, China is a different case. But in these countries, it's very difficult then for oppositions or independent voices to either hold the government accountable or to compete, even in manipulated elections. So control of information. And then, of course, the technology questions about social media enter in as well. Well, I want to thank you for joining us. This is all the time we have, unfortunately, but I think it was a, a really, really great conversation. And Thank you for joining us on the podcast. All right. Thanks, Jacob. I enjoyed it. You've been listening to Global Stage, produced by the Kellogg Institute for International Studies. Listen to other episodes here or wherever you get your podcasts. Global Stage also can be found online at kellogg.nd.edu or by asking your smart speaker to play Global Stage. <laughs>